So one of the solutions that we've been pushing for regularly at NIJWJ is to close these uh, corporate tax loopholes. I found that $85 uh, million dollars per year to the CMA to be absolutely egregious. That's the only word for it. But another proposal that's relatively new and I think deserves uh, good consideration, serious consideration, because it doesn't require uh, going through the constitutional amendment process that a graduated income tax does is a speculation sales tax. Uh, please welcome Bill Barkley. Thank you, John. Can you put up the first slide? I spent 22 years in financial services. During that course of that time, I actually invented a derivative product. I don't know to what circle of Dante's hell that consigns me, but I think I have some responses. Now, I hope many of you have seen this slide before, but even if you have, I want you to look at it again. Because this is where I start from when I think about this bill, when I think about what's going on in Washington, when I think about what comes up day in and day out when I read the Chicago Tribune, or listen to some chattering head on TV. Because the people who caused this crisis are not the people who are being asked to pay for it. That's, that's a fundamental problem. You can go to the next slide. This bill, like other bills, is not about political leadership. It's about trying to saddle people who didn't cause the crisis with paying for it. So what would political leadership actually look like if we took it seriously in this state, in Washington, and elsewhere? And here we go on the next slide to things that people have, point people have made several times already. It's a question of revenue, not a question of spending. So I have, following Jonathan Swift, a modest proposal. As I said, I spent 22 years in financial services. They were, I worked at several derivative exchanges in Chicago. I was a researcher, I was a marketer, I, did, I created products. And during the course of my life there, I learned a lot about finance, and after I retired in 2004, I learned some more. And I started thinking about, okay, how could we raise a reasonable amount of money by broadening the tax base? It's a very, a very uh, a, a sort of an in phrase, I understand that nowadays from listening to what's going on in Washington. And I said, let's talk about a very simple way. Let's say that every time you bought or sold a future or an option contract, you paid $1. $1. By the way, how many of you buy and sell futures and options? Okay, well, I, I do, but not many other people do. It doesn't surprise me somehow. You pay $1 when you bought it and $1 when you sold it. If you think of the size of the contracts, even a relatively small contract, futures on corn. The corn futures contract is for 5,000 bushels of corn. And corn was trading about $8 a bushel this summer. Well, let's say it's trading only $6 a bushel. $30,000 value contract a $1 fee when you buy it and a $1 fee when you sell it. A very, very, very small portion of the contract. And compared to large contracts, it's even smaller. And I might say, well, really, how much money would that raise? Let's see. $6 billion a year. It's a lot of money. A lot of money. More money than I'm going to see in my lifetime, probably more money than you're going to see in your lifetime either. But it would really help the financial situation of the state of Illinois, including the financial situation around pensions. Now, I know somebody's going to say, and let's go on to the next slide, you will be told that the Chicago Mercantile Exchange will move if we do this. Now, this is a kind of financial transaction tax. There are financial transaction taxes in the UK, Singapore, Hong Kong, Switzerland, South Korea, Taiwan, Japan, Brazil, France, and so forth, and the exchanges do not pay one cent of the financial transaction tax. So the exchange itself, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange and the Chicago Board Options Exchange, where I worked for 12 years of my life, have no incentive to move for this tax. You will be told the traders will move. Well, where can they go and trade these same products? They actually can't. It's not as easy to move this stuff as you think it is. Let's think about the actual arithmetic here. When you look at one of these contracts, they all have an amount of price that they can move. So on taking that small contract, that corn futures contract, the smallest amount that contract can change in value by is one quarter of one cent, which on 5,000 bushels is $12.50 a contract. You're telling me 
for, so for your first and your last price gain, you only got 1150 rather than 1250, you're going to go somewhere else? I don't believe it. I know I wouldn't, and I trade these things. Or you look at other contracts, and we have the S&P 500 futures, where the smallest price change is $25 a contract. So you only make $24 on the first price change or $24 on the last price change when you buy it and sell it and you go somewhere else. Actually, you can't go somewhere else to trade this, as a matter of fact. You're not going to do that. So this is, you know, the, when you're talking about the macro level, about how business will move, it sounds very persuasive. But when you actually look at the arithmetic and think of yourself as a farmer, as a hedger, a portfolio manager, a hedger, or a speculator, you're not going to move for this dollar contract. You might also say, if you really would think people would move for a dollar contract, why hadn't some other exchange put these contracts up, cut their rates, subsidize the cost, and made up that dollar and moved the business? Because it's not enough to move the business, that's why. Okay, next slide. So, this is a, this is a good kind of tax. You know, economists talk about taxes that are good and bad. This is a good kind of tax for a variety of reasons. One, you want a tax that is is a small amount on every single event. Well, a dollar per contract on these contracts that range anywhere from $30,000 to $2 million is a small amount on a single event. You want a contract that spreads over a large number of people, that spreads over a large number of users. Not many of the people in this room, I grant you, but still a large number of users. You want, a, you, want a contract, you want a tax that hits people who can bear the cost. And the reason that I knew not many of you in this room would put your hands up when I asked you traded futures and options is these contracts are not traded by most people in this country. They're traded by wealthy individuals and wealthy institutions. Wealthy individuals and wealthy institutions that can very well afford this kind of very, very, very small tax. And finally, you want a tax that pursues economic and social justice. That's why I started with the very first slide, that this does pursue economic and social justice. It's progressive. This is a tax that would take more from those who have more, and it would be a tax that would favor those who have little. The other reason I think about things like this is there was this bank robber back in the 20th century, a guy named Willie Sutton, and he robbed a whole bunch of banks. He was asked one time by a newspaper man, why do you rob banks? He looked at him like he was crazy, because that's where the money is. So when you're thinking about revenue expansion, you've got to think about where the money is. Ron talked about the question of how much the 1% does or doesn't pay. You've got to think about where the money is. So I, as I said, you've got this kind of tax at a much higher level, by the way, in many countries around the world already. Europe is going to put this kind of tax on across nine or maybe 11 countries in the continent. So this kind of tax, this financial transaction tax, of which a speculation sales tax is a little tiny example, is something that could do a lot for the state of Illinois. Who would pay it? Well, you can see up here. Wouldn't be most of the people in this room. I might pay it. My trade it wouldn't affect my trading whatsoever. Institutions such as banks, hedge funds, broker dealers, day traders, high net wealth individuals. That's who the tax would fall on. So this is a kind of revenue solution. It's not the complete solution, but it's a kind of revenue solution that people should start thinking about. And that political leadership, if we actually could find some, would actually start to raise. Thank you. <laughs>